first speaker. Uh, it says a business leader's perspective, but Mr. Kazarian is really an expert on uh, financial markets. Um, he has been uh, heavily involved in uh, following the, uh, the situation of evolving debt. Um, he's, in, in, uh, he's currently the head of Japonica Partners. He had previously a stint at, as investment banker at Goldman Sachs and was CEO of, of Sunbeam Oyster. Uh, very much uh, a follower and, uh, and uh, actor in the Greek uh, debt crisis. Uh, well, it says he's become uh, one of the largest uh, bidders of Greek bonds. Uh, I got some quotation that uh, uh, one really considers Paul a national hero for his work in Greece over the last five years uh, in uh, public uh, financial management and has been uh, really trying to get, uh, give some more light on the debt situation also in a more technical way about uh, how the uh, debt situation can be uh, dealt with um, by uh, educating uh, people around the world on the situation. So we look forward to your introductory remarks. You have about half an hour, I think, uh, for your intervention. Yeah. Uh, there will be uh, questions just following your talk. Uh, so probably uh, 20 minutes talk and then 10 minutes uh, discussion would be fine. Thank you very much. going to start the clock here for a moment. Okay. Um, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak here. This is a very prominent program by Webster, and the organizers have done a fabulous job in arranging different people from very different perspectives. Um, without falling off the panel here, um, I'm going to provide a business leader's perspective, <clears throat> and I'm going to use two key undeniable facts on Greece to win the trust and confidence, which is our focus, um, of taxpayers and the global capital markets. You know, our view is that you need to win the trust and confidence of your taxpayers and the capital markets to move forward. So that's where we start. Um, my bona fides, I can go through very quickly. We've made, over the last five years, we're large holders of debt, as you had mentioned, and we've been focusing on Greece for five years now. Uh, we have a team of 150 people, uh, all the accounting firms. Uh, it's a wide, wide range of individuals. Um, we've made over 100 presentations to rating agencies, OECD. Um, I've now been appointed a sole special advisor to a task force in Brussels on balance sheet management to help governments in Europe actually manage their balance sheets, as some, one of the speakers will talk a little bit about today. Um, I've now been appointed a visiting professor uh, at Ishkete in Lisbon to discuss this as well because Portugal is very much moving very quickly ahead on this. Uh, I was awarded in 2016 the William Pitt the Younger Award for Government Financial Management, uh, cited in many publications. For my day job, I'm the CEO of Japonica Partners, which is a billion plus, a multi-billion investment firm. Um, two key undeniable facts, if this is the only thing you can remember from my comments, there's just two. I try to keep it very, very simple so it's memorable. One is that despite political claims to the contrary, the debt to GDP ratio is universally recognized as the single most important measure of Greece government debt sustainability. So what, what you'll hear in my comments is when we prove that the number that's used to currently, the 180 percent, is completely wrong, as we've done, it's just completely, completely, totally wrong, the reflex reaction is, well, it doesn't matter. So you're going to hear this, whether it's with the IMF or in Brussels, as soon as we prove the numbers like flawed, 
incorrectly calculated, even by European standards, the re response then is, well, it doesn't really matter anyways. It does matter, it's used throughout. That's fact number one. Fact number two is that there are vested interests who are very strong that refuse to acknowledge that they have agreed to support internationally agreed upon accounting or statistic standards to measure debt, which require that reported debt provide a true and fair view of economic reality. So it's, it, these aren't my standards, as people often say. Oh, this is your view. No, it's not my view. It's these organizations, whether they're the IMF, the EC, they have signed public documents and passed laws saying that you should use these international standards. And that's, that's, that's one, is that debt to GDP is important. Don't let people tell you it's not after we've proven it's wrong. And two, that these organizations have already passed and signed documents supporting the international standards. These aren't our standards. Okay, I'm on minute three. Okay, undeniable fact one, we've just gone through. Um, examples of undeniable fact number one is the IMF still uses debt to GDP to determine Greece's projected interest rates. So when they build their debt sustainability models, their interest rates are driven by the same ratio, debt to GDP, that they will say is meaningless after you prove that it's meaningful. So yes, it, they'll say it's meaningless, but then they'll still use it to drive their interest rates, which not surprisingly in their modeling show in Greece government paying interest rates in the future as high as 20%. <laughs> And there's no entity, if you put 20% interest in your models, of course they're going to show explosive debt. Um, the IMF and the EC use debt to GDP to produce their 2060 debt to GDP ratio. The rating agencies cite debt to GDP as the single most important number. And the media, all you read in every article is debt to GDP, mountainous debt, mountainous debt. So don't let anybody tell you after we've proven it's wrong that the number doesn't matter. It does matter. Um, the IMF has mentioned in their DSA, at the top one, that the debt to GDP patient is not a very meaningful proxy. In their documents, you will see it. But then they go on and use it throughout all their projections and information. So it's not meaningful, but then they use it throughout. Um, they use a 2060 debt to GDP ratio, which you'll hear in the political dialogue. And just to show you an example of how meaningless that number is, if you look here very quickly, in June of 2014, they were saying the projected debt to GDP ratio for Greece was going to be 60%. Okay, that was in 2014. Now they're projecting 2060, okay, when I think many of us, well, I will be dead, okay? In two years, they then projected to go to 275. That's <laughs> The, the number is a meaningless, absolutely meaningless number. You can't go from a projection of 60 to 275 in 24, 25, 26 months when the actual debt for Greece only went from 70 to 75. These are inherently political numbers with a political dialogue. Um, the rating agencies, this is just a summary matrix, all they really, they'll talk about a lot, but the key number they put in almost every single weakness for Greece is the debt to GDP ratio. It is the debt, you can just, we highlighted different sections, debt to GDP, mountainous debt to GDP, debt to GDP, it's riddled throughout their reports and it's usually the first item. So when, when we prove it's wrong and it's been proven wrong, don't, don't let people tell you it's not meaningful, it is meaningful. Oops, okay, hold on. Okay, um, fact number two, is that the vested interests have already agreed to use international standards. There are international standards, just checking my time. One second, hold on. Good, uh, slide six, perfect. There are international standards to measure debt. You don't have to sit and make up your own standards. This isn't an opinion. Uh, and I'll go through who has used them, and they're all to provide a true and fair view of economic reality. That's the goal. Um, there's two types of standards, you'll hear accounting and you'll hear statistics. Accounting is what is used at a government level often or in the public and the private markets for companies. That's accounting. And then you'll have statistics standards which are used by economists. 
uh, SNA 2008, ESA, they're macro statistics based. So there's two broad categories. Within the first accounting, you have public sector and you have private sector. Within the international statistics standards, you have system of national accounts and the European systems. So that's your group. You have two groups of standards. Not surprisingly, they are harmonized. So the standards do exist. Um, the IPSIS standards are used <clears throat> as the best practice. The leading governments on, on accounting all use them. New Zealand, UK, Canada, Australia, Switzerland, UK, France, Israel. We just put a huge list of them. This is the standard you use to calculate the true and fair economic reality. It exists. Um, then there's IFRS. It's safe to say 100% of every, every company you will see uses the same standards to calculate debt as the governments do. This is the agreed upon standard. Now we've just done accounting. Then you go to statistics, macroeconomic statistics. They are harmonized with the accounting. They're basically the same, not as refined, not as detailed, because they don't have to be audited, but they are generally the same. And they've been officially endorsed by the European Commission as a law, by the IMF, by the World Bank, the UN, the OECD. All five have signed the forward encouraging all countries to comply and report on 2008 as soon as possible. The goal is economic reality, and they are harmonized with everything else. So we did accounting, and then there's one more, which is ESA 2010, which is the European version. That's been legislated with a force of law. There is legislation passed in Parliament that says you must use ESA. ESA is designed to provide economic reality of the number. It is harmonized with the others, and the European Commission signed in 2008 that urged everybody to rapidly adopt it. So these are the standards. They have signed them. Um, the meaning of Maastricht, which is the number you hear, the 180, it's misunderstood. The Maastricht definition of debt, which is debt at future face value, was never, never, ever intended to reflect economic reality. It was put in a treaty to use for codification purposes by lawyers. You could have 0% debt due in 2,000 years from now and debt due five years from now at 20%. Maastricht was a legal treaty. It was never intended to be used to reflect economic reality. It was modified with ESA 2010 because they realized they had to become more precise with the number. That was before ESA. It was before Ipsos. It was before SNA. The 60% criteria, as you had mentioned, has long ago become meaningless. Debt, the debt is a future face that is incorrectly and widely assumed to be in compliance with internationally agreed upon standards. It is not. It violates every single standard that exists, and people just deny it like a rock. Okay, the real numbers, when you calculate them on the standards, which all four accounting firms, this is not us, the real number under international accounting standards is 75% of GDP, or 132. The real number under macroeconomic statistics standards is 91%, or 161. You can use SNA, you can use ESA, it doesn't matter. And whether it's 75 or 91, it's not a big difference. It sure as hell is not 180. And these are international standards that have been agreed upon by all the organizations. This is not us. You can pick accounting. You can pick statistics. It does not matter. But you have to do your homework. Um, this, we, we then look at debt to GDP, debt service, debt relief, fixed and floating. The, the errors, we do a comparison of all the peers. We state their debt. You're much lower than everybody at the average. And I can go through the numbers. This is slide 18. The slides are up on most important reform website. You can Google them. You can get the numbers. They're up there right now. All your metrics are better if you use real standards. Your fixed versus floating number that you hear all the time is just, again, totally wrong using international standards. It's not 90%. It's only 17%. When political dialogue aside, these are the real numbers using real standards. Debt relief, the current government has received like 46 billion of debt relief, and they don't quantify it. It's just, it's there, you, the standards are available. Um, Greece is not required to, nor should they use the Maastricht number to communicate to key stakeholders. Okay, one, it's compliance with the treaty. That's a legal compliance, just wanna check my time. 
hold on. Perfect, 12, 20, perfect. Okay, um, you'll hear the comment, well, we're required to show that number. Yes, you are required by law, like a bank loan covenant, to show the number. But you're not required to show it to, to your taxpayers. You're not required to show it to the rating agencies. And you're not required to show it to investors. You should show the international number. Greece should provide the internationally comparable numbers that provide true and fair value. And they should do it to taxpayers, the capital markets, and the rating agencies. Do not confuse your loan covenant with the ESM, with communicating with your stakeholders to build trust and confidence. Loan covenants are loan covenants. You can agree that an, a mountain or a molehill is, you know, whatever you want. But for economic reality, to build trust and confidence, you use the international standards. Greece is solely responsible for providing the correct numbers. It's not the ESM's job. It's not the IMF's job. You are a sovereign nation. You are responsible for providing your own numbers. It's hard work. It takes time, and you need professionalism. In the absence of correctly calculated debt numbers, key stakeholders have no choice but to use the macro number. If you're not going to publish the right number as a nation, they will default to Maastricht, which is not in compliance with ESA 2010, not in compliance with SNA 2008, not in compliance with Ipsos, not in compliance with nothing. It is a Maastricht, it's a legal number, but if you don't take responsibility and calculate yourself, there's nobody else who's going to do it. And in the absence, we talk about that. Okay, that's this. Um, justification for, for using the overstated Greece debt number are flawed and destructive. Okay, one. Greece must only report the Maastricht number. It's absolutely wrong. You can publish your own financial statements. There's nothing to prevent you from doing it. It's not illegal. I mean, it's nothing. France does it. The UK does it. Austria does it. Portugal will do it. These are international standards that have been mandated by the IMF and the SNA, by the World Bank. By, they told you to do it. Greece is, is not solely responsible. Wrong. You are solely responsible. You're a sovereign nation. You have to publish your own numbers. Greece government will not implement reforms unless the debt continues to be overstated. Wrong. If the, if the reform, I mean, spending, whatever, if you're driving spending for the wrong reason based on a dumb number that doesn't exist, You've basically created this spending downward spiral for a reason that does not exist because the number is wrong. It's like using, you know, 40 hours in a 24-hour day. No, the number's wrong. Um, voters will not accept reforms unless the debt continues to be overstated. That's wrong, too. The voters aren't stupid. Assuming they're dumb, so you have to act in dumb policy, you will end up with dumb policy and dumb decisions. And you don't blame the voters, blame the people who are making the policy. Or voters will not be happy to learn that the debt's been overstated. No, they'll be joyful, because then you start maybe implementing, you know, correct policy, good management, and good policy, and good insights, and good spending, and realize there's a difference between investment and spending, and what's smart and what's not smart. Um, reporting highly concessional restructured debt, which is what you have, or face value violates internationally agreed upon accounting standards. One example, this is the one I had mentioned. I'm gonna walk down here so I can see this. All right, here's the example. If you have a triple C credit, which is Greece, okay? And you have 7% debt due in five years, okay? You're paying, think of it yourself. 7% debt due in five years. And the bank or your creditors come over to you and say, I'm now going to make that 0%, and you don't have to pay me for 1,000 years. What's the value of that debt? Most people would say zero, because there's no interest doing 1,000 years, like a millennium, like whatever. No, under Maastricht, uh, first of all, yes, according to economic reality, it changes. Yes, when seeking true and fair value. Yes, according to accounting. Yes, according to statistics. But with Maastricht, there is no change. The number stays the same. It's a political construct. It has no reflection of economic reality. You could put 2,000 years on that. You could put a negative interest rate on that. It makes no difference. The number is absolutely meaningless. It has become obsolete. It's a dinosaur number. And this is not us. These are every single standard. You can look on our website. There's like 40 different opinions from like the people from New Zealand and Austria. I mean, just like there's a wide range, the former UK head. I and mean, the list is, I think, some of us, 
I think there's over 100 different people who are professional and technical who said, no, the number's wrong. Stop making decisions based on the wrong number. The so-called sovereign debt economists, and that's why it's so nice that you invited us here, basically, they hide. They continue to hide their huge mistakes, which are huge mistakes, because the country's suffered since at least the second restructuring. And it was high in 2010, restructure, 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 2012, it came down. They missed it totally. There's been suffering in Greece, stupid decision-making, unproductive economy. You've been falling backwards. You're not leading. They, wanna, they, don't want, they don't want to admit the mistake. They will not publicly debate us at all. No public debate. And we've offered up to $100,000 for a single person to come and debate us on stage, and we donate it to their charity, favorite charity. No, because they're dead-ass wrong. They publish play papers that blatantly don't state the existence of either accounting or st uh, st uh, statistic standards. Like they'll write entire papers in public and never mention that they're accounting or statistic standards. Like as if they don't exist. They organize debt conferences and then refuse to allow any accountants or statisticians to attend the conference to challenge them. They're hiding. They've made major, major mistakes. Um, the sovereign nation, you're responsible. It's no one else's responsibility. Uh, inexperience or unawareness is no excuse. Don't blame others for not calculating the debt. Don't blame Maastricht. Don't blame the ECB. Don't blame the IMF. Your official sector partners, the capital markets and the credit agencies need to be educated on what's going on and not correctly, correctly calculating past debt relief and as of this, I think my last slide. So I just want to check my time one minute. I'm very time conscious. Perfect. I have 19 minutes and a half. So I'm sticking right to 20, okay? This is the last slide. Not correctly reporting past debt relief and asking for more is perpetuating the economic malaise in Greece. Your number's already massively low. It's one of the lowest in Europe. Any metric you want, but debt to GDP is important. It is centrally important, so don't let people dismiss it after you find out that it's wrong. Not correctly reporting true and fair economic reality of Greece, debt numbers, is largely overstated. Not correctly the third program debt relief is that, and then claiming additional debt relief is necessary. You're telling the capital markets your debt's unsustainable and the government deserves higher borrowing costs. So you're now going to try to issue bonds, Greece, in July. And the first thing you do when you walk into an investor is, you tell them, we're bankrupt, we can't pay our debt. <laughs> oh, and you want money from us? But we're bankrupt, we can't pay our debt, and everything's dependent on Germany. So, still invest. You tell the rating agency analysts the same thing. Keep us at triple C, because we're in bankrupt. We're not gonna give you the right numbers. You suffocate in the economy and international competitiveness, and you ignore internet, you ignore the agreed upon standards to win the trust and confidence of your taxpayers and global capital markets. That's 20 minutes. All right. Which is shorter than you would ask, but not bad. Thank you very much. Perfect. Where the big discrepancy between this, as you say, IMF number of 180 and uh, the ones you present, uh, you might, I might be wrong, but in a nutshell, the economically meaningful uh, notion of debt is uh, the present value of future repayment <laughs> uh, flows, I guess. And obviously, this is highly uh, a function of the maturity of your debt and the implied interest rate you apply to it. Yeah? And of course, income, debt to, in, debt to GDP is a function of the growth rate and expectations of income flows. I, I, I leave it to you to, to answer in a minute. Yeah? But while uh, what uh, the other concept is basically the normal uh, debt which has been taken out and which uh, people like Merkel and so on thinks the uh, German taxpayers are still due in terms of the initial normal value uh, of credit uh, given to a country 
uh, of course, if there was tax relief, that uh, falls. So uh, this is my, uh, in, in my short, how I would think the different discrepancy arrives, but uh, you might have a different answer. Uh, we, uh, there will be a session in the afternoon which uh, concentrates on debt and uh, sustainability of debt. Uh, but um, uh, let me take a few questions and then you might... Can I answer yeah, okay. okay just... Hello? Again, you, you just press. Hello? Hello, okay. Uh, the first point is the response you get here trying to rationalize what's happening is usually the first response, most respectfully, for someone who doesn't understand that there are international standards. That's usually the first response because, because you know, they just think that what's been said. So this whole notion of that there are internationally agreed upon standards to measure debt that have been used for decades by governments, it's kind of ignoring the fact that if you want to build trust and confidence, you must really use the standards. So, so, so that's, but, but that you can't minimize that because if you want to develop trust and confidence of anyone, you have to agree to use the standards. Now the, ration, now the rationale that has existed for decades and has been agreed upon by the IMF, the OECD, the World Bank, passed in Parliament, is that you, they develop these very lengthy standards that says when you change the value or terms of the debt, that debt is extinguished. Now, these are the law. It's like a law passed. So you extinguish the debt. Once you extinguish that debt, you must show the debt or the asset, because it's, on, it's a symmetrical, at the value of that debt that exists on the day. If you don't do that, then you breed massive corruption, political instability. Now, those are the rules that everyone has agreed upon. Now, the logic and economic rationale starts with what reflects economic reality? That's where you start, okay? So when you take and you restructure the Greeks' debt, which you have now five times, Greece's debt has been restructured five different times. It started off with high coupons, short maturity, and each of these over this four-year period, they've changed the terms of the debt. So each time you change the terms of the debt, you then revalue the debt using the rules. Okay, what did you do to deferred interest? Now, you may not understand this, but Greece had periods where they don't pay any interest for 10 years. Okay, Greece has debt on their books that is paid at a negative 10%. Negative, did you know they had negative 10% debt? No one knew that, okay? No one knew that. We found it out in documents, okay? You have to go in and dig into the documents. You then, when you understand the documents, you apply all these international agreed upon rules. Negative interest, extended maturities, deferred maturities, rebates, for example. Just, it's such a simplistic understanding. It's, um, okay, I give you 50, okay, in interest, and I give you 50 in principal. You, I gave it to you. You immediately give me back my principal and interest. Was that really debt on your books or not? It's not debt. If the agreement is I give you back all the interest and I give you back all the principal or 20% of the principal, that's not nominal value anymore. It's not an economic theory where you have to look at it like, uh, no, these are practical understandings of understanding the terms. Now, the extinguishment that happens is all the standards say you look at the value of the most comparable instrument on the day. This isn't an economist debate where we sit around and talk for hours and days. This has gone on. Everybody's agreed to it. You use it. So you look at the value that it was extinguished on that day and you get the most independent appraisal you can because if you let somebody sit in a room and make up their own friggin' number, you don't develop trust and confidence from anybody because they're politically motivated. When we do our numbers here, we had to set up independent committees at each one of the four firms and we weren't even allowed to be involved in, the, in, in, in what they had to follow the rules. We couldn't be involved because in order to have trust and confidence in the numbers, they had to follow them. So you say, what was the value at that date? Now, this is, that's fine, but if you don't understand this, it's just like, this is such an important question. If you don't understand it, then just building on garbage is more garbage, okay? As your debt goes out each year, all the rules say the debt moves up because it has to get to that future face value by the time it matures. 
Do you understand that? So it starts here when you begin, but it methodically goes up. And those are the standards. Now, economists hate this because they go, oh, we want to debate it. It's like, no, they happen to be the rules everybody's agreed upon in every single sector. So when the debt goes up, that period of time that you've had the resources of the views, you don't have to cut back on austerity because you can use that to reinvest and you get better returns because you're not cutting back on the money. So as long as your growth goes, you don't have to cut to get to this fictitious number. So the rationale is it best reflects economic reality. Now, if you want to go to a committee and sit there for five days and debate what is best economic reality, you will conclude that the universally standards, without question, extinguish debt, best reflect economic reality. That's the logic. It's not what you said. It's not debate. It's not present value. Those are concepts you use in your first year of an economist course. Chapter one, present value. It's not present value. There's no such thing as present value of debt or net present. You have to find the value at that. Otherwise, you breed corruption and non-comparability. So at least in terms of your first point, at least we get that right. Okay? Go ahead. Shall we uh, get some uh, questions or comments? Yeah, please. And, and, and I can pull them up here. Hold on, pretty quickly. Okay, now, what we've done was just to show these aren't our numbers, okay? For other countries. Well, well, it's not even ours. It's IFRS Ipsos on the left. It's SNA, which is the System of National Accounts. It's ESA. It's the IMF's own debt same sustainability, which they have their own rules. IMF baseline and excess deficit procedures. So when you go through these numbers, you have to spend the time and the people, each one of these we've had to set up separate teams because each one's its own profession. You have to understand it. And as you can see, the IMF debt sustainability analysis, which they have rules that they have published in different silos, which aren't used in Greece, by the way, because it's a different silo. Paul Thompson uses future face value, and he loves it because it's easy to understand, and it keeps the number really high, and they can charge you large interest rates, which basically gives them all their revenue. Otherwise, they would, they would have lost $750 million last year. Um, so one, that's that method, that's that method, IS, SNA, and you have to do each one. They're all, even the IMF's own DSA is 116. It's not 180. Okay, these aren't ours, they're their rules, apply the rules, and if they're willing to sit in his chair and say these aren't the rules, they should do it and we've offered them. Okay, now the comparison is this. Okay, here you go. This is using international accounting standards. Which are the best? The most detailed, the most comprehensive, used by the best governments. Your balance sheet debt is 75%, Cyprus is 88, Ireland 71, Italy 133. Italy doesn't change because they have no restricted debt yet. They haven't, okay? Portugal, a little bit lower than face value. Spain, really no change from face value, using the rules as they exist. Now, you can take cash interest. You're below the peer average. Your debt service, look at it another way, which we look at all the different ways, is 6.6% versus the average of 10. GFN, if you use it correctly, the GFN is 4.2 still below the 9.6 of everyone, and vastly below Italy at like 20.6. These are the numbers, and we have, we, we've sent them to, we actually, if you go to the most important reform website, you will see the IMF response to our slides that we did for the spring. You should read the responses in the back, which came from Jerry Rice, and then read the retort. <laughs> There's no doubt in your mind that you will realize they're dead ass wrong. Read them yourselves, take a look at them. You caught them, they're not using their own best practices. The IMF has their best press practices, they're not using them. Average maturity, look at the difference. Look at the difference, 25.5 years versus 9.6 years, okay? Interest expense, I mean, just look at them. These are fundamentally different. So this is your comparison. I don't know, he didn't hear it because he's on the phone, but it's slide 18, okay? So you can. Okay. Uh, question or comment? Uh, 
feel free. I mean, I, this is like important stuff for the country. I think we are running late. Uh, okay, Nicholas, don't feel yeah? free. Okay, then. thank you very much. Okay.